say, hey, somebody should have recorded that. So it should be recording now. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I have a slide deck that I'll share um, just to keep us moving. But like I said, uh, feel free to jump in at any point. Um, and so let me see if I can make this more of a slideshow. Does that show full screen now? Okay. Um, so thank you for coming here. Thank you for being a part of this talk. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about transdisciplinarity. We're going to talk about um, critical literacy. Um, and one of the things that, um, and, and in this, we will share some of the research that I've been conducting with Dr. Radakovich, who's on the call, and colleagues of ours, um, trying to make sense of what is transdisciplinarity? Uh, how do we get to transdisciplinarity? Do we want to get there? Um, and then germane to our discussions here is um, what challenges does that provide for us as we move into disciplinary literacy? Um, so I know that that's something that's near and dear to many of our hearts, thinking about content area, reading, writing, or disciplinary literacy. And so uh, Nenad and I and, and so, several of our colleagues had a piece where we looked at some of our research and we suggested that... Um, that it's really problematic to go into these silos of the different content areas. So we'll try and spell out some of this. Um, but once again, a lot of this is uh, based upon uh, two or three different research pieces, a couple different publications, a lot of different presentations, um, but most importantly, a lot of um, half-baked ideas, which I think is the best thing that we can put out there. Um, so one of the things that we're going to suggest in this is that um, we come to this with the desire to look at and solve or address wicked problems. Um, a wicked problem uh, is something that's not simple. It's not easily solved. Um, Nenada and I are going to make the, uh, we're going to suggest that we should use our time to address and, and maybe not solve, but at least, uh, you know, to take a look at wicked problems in our classrooms and in our practice. Um, and we're going to try and make the case that a transdisciplinary lens is necessary uh, for us to effectively look at uh, th these wicked problems. Um, I'm Ian O'Byrne. I'm at the College of Charleston. Uh, I blog a lot. I have a weekly newsletter. Uh, Nena, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, my name is uh, Nena Dredakovic. I'm uh, between institutions right now. Uh, uh, until the 31st, I'm going to be at College of Charleston, and starting from January 1st, I'm from. Uh, I'm going to be at uh, Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. What is your background? What do you study? What do you um, do? Uh, it's math education, and uh, in the last couple of years, it's been more and more STEM education and STEAM education, and looking at transdisciplinarity. Uh, Nenad uh, wrote the book on transdisciplinarity, uh, so he was transdisciplinarity when transdisciplinarity wasn't as cool and buzzy as it is now, um, and so what's fun for me in my research and in our research team is to, you know, work with Nenad and, you know, someone that knows what this really is, and and I think that Nenad would probably disagree that Nen, that he knows exactly what transdisciplinarity is, uh, but try and make sense of of what is what's he seeing, what's the field seeing um, as we proceed. Um, where did transdisciplinarity begin? Was it in math or was it elsewhere? I think that people would argue that uh, it came from the way that Piaget was looking at psychology, that uh, Piaget was. Uh, uh, coining the word transdisciplinarity in the 60s and the 70s, but it really uh, started uh, in, uh, in the 70s and in the 80s when people were looking at the ways to solve, uh, to solve problems that either have to do with environment, also in, in medical sciences, mm -hmm. the word transdisciplinarity comes out a lot. Okay. So today we're going to talk about uh, wicked problems. What are they? 
uh, try to make sense of how and why we might embed, embed these in our classroom. We're going to look at transdisciplinarity and critical literacy and then take a look at some of the work that we're doing, thinking about how do we address wicked problems as they come up in our classroom. Um, so, Janelle, uh, what do you hope to gain from this? Do you want to introduce yourself? <laughs> well, uh, hello. Uh, hello again, Ian, and, and hi. Um, for the first time, uh, Nanad, um, I um, am in Michigan and um, I'm, I'm part of Michigan's effort to um, scale disciplinary literacy work throughout the state. Um, and I would just say on a personal level, the idea of, of transdisciplinarity um, and interdisciplinary lenses is interesting to me um, because of my background in international baccalaureate um, and knowing that those programs really lean into uh, those ideas depending on the level. So just very interesting to see how, how we're inter intersecting those. And then of course, I'm thinking a little bit about critical literacy with, with Rochelle and with some work that I do in Metro Detroit. So absolutely. Thank you for being here. Um, so when we talk about wicked problems, um, it's important to make a case for, to fully understand what are wicked problems, but I think the bigger challenge is whether or not we want to allow them into our classroom. Um, so a wicked problem is a, socially, a social or cultural challenge. It's not simple or easily solved. There's um, it has different groups and structures uh, and systems, has unpredictable outcomes, um, and one of the, the key reasons why we call it a wicked problem is it defies typical problem solving techniques. Um, in our classroom, some earlier research that Nenad and colleagues and I in, embarked upon, uh, we looked at divergent thinking and convergent thinking um, and, and, you know, the, the rationalization that not all questions have like easy A, B, C, D answers or true, false answers or answers. Um, and so a, a wicked problem is one of those pieces that we need to imply a systems theory lens. Um, you know, the systems theory is basically um, suggesting that uh, we look at groups of natural or human-made interrelated, interrelated, not interrelated, that's not a word at all, uh, and interdependent uh, components and what happens as those pieces interact with one another. What happens when these groups interact and rub up against one another? Uh, when they rub up against one another, we have other things that happen. Um, we can see synergy. So we could see individual components. We'll say, all right, if we, you know, we we add a little bit more of this compound and we reduce some of this compound, we might see an interaction that is greater than the combined. Uh, effective other individual components. Um, we also might have some emergent behaviors. Hey, Carmen. So we might have some emergent behaviors. We might see uh, things that are unanticipated side effects of these interactions. Um, and emergent behaviors, they could be good or bad. They could be beneficial, benign, potentially harmful. Um, and so it's not the situation where we could say, well, if you were just to do this and then that, this will happen. Uh, we have to try and unpack what are all the, the ultimate components. Um, the work on wicked problems, a lot of the initial uh, you know, thought behind this is, no, we're all, no, no problem, Carmen. Carmen, you wanna unmute and say, hey, tell us when you're checking in from and what you're looking to hear or, or learn. Let me know in the chat and I'll, I'll un or, or you can unmute as well. Um, so uh, when we think about wicked problems, there are 10 properties that try to, um, from Miami, sweet. Um, we'll talk more about what the temperatures are around here. Um, so we look at the 10 properties of wicked problems. Um, and we already talked about every problem being unique or there's no clear problem definition. Um, one of the pieces that's very interesting to me uh, is multiple stakeholders with conflicting agendas. So you might look at something like health policy or public health, um, you know, as we are in the middle of or on our way out of a global pandemic, you know, what agendas are behind some of these pieces. Um, 
you know, uh, these problems are connected to others. They might straddle, important for our work here, wicked problems often straddle organizational disciplinary boundaries. So they don't exist just in public health. They don't exist just in technology. There are different components that that stretch across all of these, um, you know, and, and then the, sol the solutions are not right or wrong, but better or worse. Um, you know, very uh, infrequently do we see a wicked problem that has just a, a good solution that helps everything. Um, so some, you know, it, what's interesting is the work on wicked problems. They'll talk about uh, problems worth solving. Uh, and there is this mentality that in our classroom, these are things that we, we, we should want to address. Um, so some things, uh, climate change is obviously a big one. That's one of the pieces that brought our research group together, thinking about transdisciplinarity. That's climate change is one of the um, areas that has, uh, you know, been the focus of some of the publications that we'll talk about here in the research. We talk about home uh, homelessness. We'll talk about sustainability. Um, a lot of the work in wicked problems um, and to a certain extent trans transdisciplinarity uh, ties into sustainability. Sustainability is also another one of those big buzzwords uh, that we're seeing in education, especially in higher ed right now. Um, public health I referenced before, but there are, you know, these wicked problems that are out there that um, we might want to address. Um, so I want to take a, a, a minute and just talk about what are some glo <laughs> global, lo global or local uh, wicked problems that you, people around you, students, youth care about? Like what, what wicked problems do you care about? Feel free to unmute, put it in the chat. What are you feeling? Dr. Radakovich, what global problems? Oh, sorry, Janelle, go for it. Oh, I'm just thinking a little bit about like some of the um, the problem based or, or locally based um, issues. So, you know, thinking about um, instead of just saying like sustainability or environmental issues, really looking critically at issues within a particular community, mm -hmm. whatever they might be. And so um, opportunities um, around that and just thinking about leveraging there's just a lot of funds around uh, local based um, work that's done with schools um, and it's a little bit underutilized. So, yeah, it's been interesting because over the last um, we a bunch of us met after a recent literacy conference and there was some pushback at how how localized a lot of the research was. You know, people did a content analysis, a colleague of mine did a content analysis, basically dropped the whole handbook or the program into, uh, you know, an app and, and said, here's the top words that came up again and again. And it was certain states, certain regions. Um, and so there's there's this push, you know, give and take um, between looking at like global networked large scale problems, but then also looking at what's happening in your own backyard, looking at, you know, what's happening it, you know, not even in your own backyard, what is of importance to the high school kids in the in the local school district? Um, so it's, it, it's, you know, that's one of those, those tensions that exists. Anybody else want to talk about what wicked problems you're thinking about? I'm thinking about uh, education, uh, but more seen from uh, uh, education as a tension that came out of uh, the pandemic between uh, maybe upper class and middle class families who had certain resources in the different marginalized communities and the tension that uh, exists there in uh, uh, between uh, looking at uh, what happened through the deficit lens, you know, basically this narrative that for two years, many kids didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. right? They're came, coming into a classroom and they don't know anything. Yeah. Uh, that narrative and maybe some other narratives that uh, could be could be used. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we talked earlier about public health uh, with two little ones, you know, and being in, in out in public all the time. That is that is important to me. Um, my area is digital literacy and, and critical evaluation. So there's a lot of 
real, you know, one of the one of the big problems that I continue to look at right now is that one of the hot buttons is uh, content moderation and social networks, you know, like in Twitter. And then another area that I try to make sense of in, in my newsletter is a lot of the, the influx of like AI generated apps and platforms and tools that we've seen over the last two weeks. Uh, we've seen this explosion of chat GPT and other stuff. And so a lot of people are talking about like, what does this do for, um, you know, each of our different spaces? So just trying to make sense of this. Um, Janelle, you want to mute and talk about that? Well, I think it just, uh, you know, kind of following on the heels of that idea of, um, you know, the, these kind of uh, outputs of the pandemic and education and some of the narrative that's that's taking place um, around, you know, catching kids up, filling the gaps, mm -hmm. um, all sorts of that language. Um, I think a general trend with, with people that I work with who work in schools is it's this general disappointment that, you know, we really thought we had an opportunity with the pandemic to rethink um, and reimagine kind of what, what the intent of school is. Um, and that kind of ties back to, you know, uh, kids wanting to have, they want their learning to be authentic and meaningful. They want to feel like they're doing something of benefit. Mm -hmm. uh, um, it's just often at odds with um, the system. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, I, I thought that, you know, when I give talks about what's happened since or in the middle of COVID, you know, one of the pieces is that, you know, what, you know, we, we have people that want to get back to normal, but normal didn't work for everybody, you know, and then this was an opportunity to peel back the layers and see some of the, the people that were really in the systems that were struggling. Um, yeah, and Carmen put in the chat, the AI pieces, it's really, I think things have drastically changed um, over the last three, four weeks. It's just amazing. You know, there's a couple pieces in science that have really that and then the fusion, um, you know, experiment recently. Um, it's just some things have, have really uh, caught my eye. Um, so I want to talk a little bit of trans transdisciplinary and critical literacy. Um, Nenad, I'm going to let you walk through this. Um, I believe I put a slide in describing what transdisciplinarity is. Um, if I did not, I will add it in. Um, yeah, Carmen in the chat also put the the you know teaching in these spaces. Um, you know the the challenge of states and and legislatures and districts where you know we can't say certain things. Um, you know, so when we talk about transdisciplinarity, wicked problems, you might have people that don't want to do this. Um, but, uh, Nenad, can you talk us a little bit? I have this slide from our paper on interdisciplinary meta and then trans. Yeah. Can you explain how these proceed? Yeah. The, the, uh, <clears throat> hardest problem for us was to identify, uh, what is the difference between interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity? And, uh, some people were saying, well, transdisciplinarity is when you use many, many, many different disciplines. But we felt that it wasn't really about quantity. There was something qualitatively was happening. And we see, after many, many talks and revisions, uh, we see interdisciplinarity as a relationship between disciplines. Here we have two disciplines, but it could be 20 disciplines. Uh, so, for example, you have an object of inquiry, let's say photosynthesis, right? And you have a discipline one, uh, biology, and you want to understand what kind of, uh, what's the difference between different plants and how much uh, oxygen they produce. Uh, and you may notice that uh, one of the factors is the area or the surface area. Now you go into discipline two, which is mathematics, and you use that discipline to uh, find the surface area of different leaves using uh, approximations, et cetera. Uh, so in this case, you have two disciplines that are kind of separately looking at the object of inquiry. So you can still see how they are different. Uh, we were trying to figure out uh, this with transdisciplinarity, there's this idea that uh, 
that there is a blurring of disciplines. And we got this idea that uh, we had this uh, project where we were looking at uh, math and music and we were, and the kids were making compositions based on regular patterns. The, uh, and uh, so we noticed that uh, it was easy for them to jump from one discipline to the other because there was this connection between music and math, which is patterns, patterns of notes versus patterns of numbers. Uh, so we got this idea that maybe what we need first is to think about really deeply uh, to understand different disciplines and the connections and differences and similarities between them. That's why we had this idea of metadisciplinarity. And one of the things is with interdisciplinary, Nenna talked a little bit about it, but you know, real simple, I I'm the technology teacher, Nenna's teaching math. We want to do a unit together. We do what normal teachers do, normal educators do is, okay, this is what I have to teach. That's what you're going to teach. Let's figure out, we're going to bring a project that brings it together. Sometimes, you know, one content area is privileged over another, but we each come in with our own areas um, of, of expertise. With the metadisciplinarity, as we were doing the research, we were thinking there's something else that's there. Like there's the that that dialogue that you have as an educator where you say, well, in, in my math class, this is what kids do, but in my technology class, this is what they do. Uh, so there's that 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 linkage that exists and trying to make sense of those spaces. More work needs to be done here. More work needs to be done with yeah. metadisciplinarity. There is the literature. I forget. Did we find a lot in the literature? Yeah, there, there is some uh, literature coming out of Eastern Europe, uh, but it's more about uh, with metadisciplinarity. They found uh, things like problem solving, perseverance, uh, use of technology that goes, you know, that shows up in the physics class and in music class and in math class. Mm -hmm. So they were looking at these themes. That's how they were looking at metadisciplinarity. These these uh, skills that are, you know, that could be distilled from each one of these disciplines. Where here, I was thinking more like uh, looking at. We were thinking more like looking at. What are the similarities and what are the differences? Mm -hmm. So in math and music, it's about it's about patterns. In uh, you know, in uh, photosynthesis, it's about the area. In uh, in maybe you know, in, in there you know, you could also look at you know physics connections between physics and some other areas and find what is this overall theme that uh, is in all of those. In the chat, I put a link to the paper that just came out um, looking at this is the math and music research that we're talking about. Uh, in the research, we were, you know, our research team, academics, researchers, and some grad students and undergrad students were trying to make sense of this. And we were having our students teach a trans, develop a transdisciplinary lesson and then teach it to kids. And so we were paying attention to how do we as a team talk about what is transdisciplinarity and we're learning, but then how do you, you know, we're educators, we learn by teaching. And so it was trying to me make sense or, or our colleagues make sense of what is transdisciplinarity and then what are the words that we use to explain it to others. Um, so transdisciplinarity, we went through interdisciplinary meta. What is transdisciplinary when we think about the relation to those others two? So the idea is that when you find this uh, connection between the dis disciplines, let, let's say if you find that uh, uh, that uh, music and math are about patterns, that when students are making a composition that uh, involves some thinking about music and thinking about mathematics, that they kind of go back and forth in between. And that there's this idea of kind of really freely traversing the area you know like right now i'm in ontario and janelle is in michigan it would be as if there was no ambassador bridge right if you could kind of go freely between you know up and down the detroit river and go into different areas so it's like that and then and it exists because there's this kind of common common connection between it um, and one of the things that was interesting to me is in the research, in the publication, um, 
we, you know, if I come into this and I'm the math, uh, I'm the music teacher and then it is the math person, like we come in with our own worldview and I come in looking at it from the math, you know, the music lens and he's looking at it from the math lens and to get to transdisciplinarity, there is this sense that we needed to, you know, use our content areas as a starting point, but then discard those. And then figure, okay, what what content do we find that's normally living in the middle of math and music? Um, Nena, do you want to talk a little bit about different levels of students for this work? Yeah, or? so uh, the focus here was on pre-service teachers. And uh, we actually, this was a, uh, this was a case study of uh, two pre-service teachers. One was... Uh, in masters of teaching program and for for uh theater but mostly she she was concentrating uh in working with elementary students and we also had uh early childhood a pre-service teacher and the students that they presented the math and music activity they were part of uh of a summer camp and they were mostly fourth graders. Yeah. So uh, when when you say level here, I'm thinking so these were novice teachers, uh, and one of them was uh, highly math anxious, and she really wanted to get math part right. What and was also yeah. interesting is, um, you know, like Nan had said, pre-service teachers, novice teachers. Um, but one of the challenge in our teacher ed program, we have students for about two years, about four semesters. And so one of the challenges that we always uh, think about is I can speak from the technology lens, you know, students start and they're just learning, they're just learning their content, they're learning pedagogy. They're just learning how to make a lesson plan and a unit plan. And in the middle of all that, I go in and I'm talking about totally reinventing pedagogy, be, you know, based upon like the SAMR model or TPAC. And so one of the challenges that our students have is like learning what is pedagogy, what is their content area, how do those connect, what are the dispositions? And while that's happening, you have this research, we were saying to them, okay, we we, we want you to go beyond just math and music. And they're like, but we're just trying to figure out math, math mm -hmm. right now. And we're like, no, go beyond that. So that was a tension. Um, Nen, you just unmuted? Yeah, I just wanted to say this is, Janelle, this is a really good point. I actually, uh, when I was uh, in Toronto many years ago, uh, working at schools there, I was very much familiar with uh, with International Baccalaureate program on secondary level. And then when I was in Charleston, uh, I worked with a local school, which was a primary school, and, and I actually attended a primary training uh, and yes uh, but this is actually my problem with uh, international baccalaureate with the philosophy of it because I strongly believe that transdisciplinarity is at any level because the world is transdisciplinary and I uh, and I think that their primary program is amazing with those kind of cross-cutting themes but they should they should keep going. I think their idea was, well, as you get older, you get more specialized. But I think this this is a trap because I think the world is very much, look at what Ian explained, we have these wicked problems and we need also high school students and college students and you know graduate students to work on the wicked problems. Uh, so uh, I see what you're talking about and uh, um, yeah, that's why I was I was curious to know just because because of that, you know, that the transdisciplinary with the primary years program and then moving into um, at least having they've backed away a bit, but having at least one interdisciplinary experience in each level in each year of the middle years program. Yeah, so that it, idea of the increasing specialization, but I think in in practice at the elementary level, what we see is such generalization um, and especially coming out of the pandemic where we see a heavy emphasis on literacy as yeah. you know a reading and writing and mathematics and science and social studies 
are kind of a nice to have once in a while. And so in reality, it's not balanced. Yeah, and then in reality, and that's why uh, what, what came out of uh, that one music and math piece was there's nothing wrong, you know, our world is, uh, uh, is organized in disciplines for better or for worse. And that's also cultural, you know, that kind of develops over time. Uh, but uh, the, uh, you should deep understand disciplines deeper, but also when this student was that was math anxious, she looked at uh, math content in, in this case deeper, but then was also able to make music connections. And making connections, if you believe in connectivism, is what learning is. And... Uh, and going beyond beyond mathematics enables you to make those connections. Uh, if if you really give time to look at those social issues, like you said, you know maybe they are uh, learning them on a superficial uh, level, or maybe as fillers. Uh, I mean, I just had like a math teacher who told me, well, you know what I tell uh, kids when they look at a problem, just take all the fluff away, all the words, and just like, let's see what, where's the math? And actually when you do that, that's where connections are lost. And uh, so definitely, that's a very, very good tension, I think, in international baccalaureate. And hopefully, you know, they realize that uh, this special specialization is not a way to go. And then, you know, that you need to keep uh, keep interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary connections. But I can also tell you that uh, in Charleston, when we worked at the International Baccalaureate School, they really struggled with uh, uh, having math uh, being transdisciplinary because people in general, I think, because just the way there's so much pressure with math, I think. But that's definitely an interesting point. I think it's, um, it, you know, in the, the challenge is that, um, you know, we needed to begin to get to transdisciplinarity. We needed to begin with our own, our own silos, our own content area. You know, so I came, I came to the work with my lens of, and I'll show this in a minute, my lens as a literacy educator and a technology person, you know, the, the, the music individual the theater one came and that was the that was the 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 way that the individual viewed the world um and but then that allowed us like a, a vantage point to see into transdisciplinarity um so what is hold on let me refresh this because i added in that slide um so i want to talk a little bit about what is transdisciplinarity um, Nene, do you want to break these down? Yeah, so these are just some things that uh, came out of uh, uh, the work, uh, primarily uh, the work that uh, Weisman and Looney Borden were uh, citing. And this is actually in the edited book that I edited with my colleague from McGill, Lim and Zhao. Uh, and you can think of transdisciplinarity and kind of going beyond just interdisciplinary work is when you are you have this idea of traversing or some people playfully call it transversing when you're crossing disciplinary boundaries and you are freely switching between math and music and technology etc for example uh, transformation comes from uh, this idea of uh, you're focusing on socially relevant issues and uh, the common good. And, uh, and this idea of what happens, transcending is very interesting because I think it has to do also with emergence. I think uh, Ian is gonna talk about it later, is you, when you are working with this different disciplines, you end up with this hybrid, which is, something totally different that you wouldn't get if you just looked at math or you just look at music. There's something else going on. And those are the, those, those emergence uh, situations are something that uh, I'm very uh, interested in, in collecting, right? Uh, instances of that. 
And there is this idea of tr transgression. And, and I think it has to do also with uh, what was mentioned, what uh, uh, Carmen mentioned in, in, uh, in uh, comments. When you're looking at wicked problems and we, you're looking for social justice problems, there, there's a level of uh, transgression that needs to be uh, that needs to be taken place. Some of the interesting pieces that that element of transgression ties in very nicely to the focus on critical literacy tonight. Um, but then another area that doesn't receive as much attention, but it's an interesting angle. Um, and it's one of the one of the members of our research team has been looking at um, is the this idea of like common good or social good or what does good mean, um, especially as we look at like uh, global contexts and, and our rush to, um, you know, move away from the global right to the local. Um, so that that idea of common good, what does that mean? Um, uh, so one of the, the 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 easiest ways for me to think about this is this is right out of the manuscript. Um, we were talking uh, our 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 teachers, our pre service teachers, are creating the plans, and we were reflecting. And then I said, you know, um, so there's a silo. We had this idea of these silos. That was this um, you know one talking point that we had. And so I asked one of our students, um, you know, what we're doing is breaking down the silos. And then the one of our, our researchers said, I, I see it more like fluid, like a water tank with math and music all together. Um, and then each liquid a different color and removing the compartment and then seeing the liquids together. So that was Emily's viewpoint of it. Um, but then me, I go back because I'm stubborn back to this totally different imagery. Um, and I said, oh, uh, a confluence, like where two rivers meet and things blix, you know, to mix together and blend. And then our other colleague, uh, the, the our, our professor of creativity who teaches our art classes said, well, I see it like mixing paint. You know, you have two colors being formed, but they maintain the original uh, color, but work together with the patterns. And I said, well, like a marble pattern or, or a monoprint and said, yes. Um, and so this this picture, this marbling of colors uh, was in our manuscript until the very end and we couldn't publish it ultimately. Um, but this was, this came back to us again and again as to what is transdisciplinarity, you know, that colors have the integrity, but they blend together and there's something else that's uh, occurring. Um, so if we shift gears a little bit, critical literacy, we talked a little bit with transgression. Nanda, do you want to say something about that? Well, I'm just uh, just looking at this uh, slide. I think that uh, uh, I just want to say about this marbling. Uh, it goes well with this idea of emergence because uh, as uh, colors and paint uh, interact with each other, you get different uh, uh, thickness, so you get different colors, which is different than maybe interdisciplinarity, which is more of a mosaic, maybe where different, you know, different glass doesn't really uh, mix with each other. But in terms of, uh, of uh, critical literacy, uh, I love this idea that it's connected to uh, transgression, but I think it's also connected with transdisciplinarity. And maybe that's where, you know, the folks in literacy that are maybe, uh, not really uh, getting the idea of transdisciplinarity, I think critical literacy is the way to go. I think critical literacy is transdisciplinary in a way. Really? Yeah, I'm kind of, I just got that <laughs> 15 seconds ago. Well, I, as I was putting the slides together and you were like, yeah, I can definitely join in. I was like, all right, I got a, I got a couple things in here that are, are meant to push your buttons. Um, so critical literacy involves questioning and examining ideas, requires us to re to synthesize, analyze, interpret, resynthesize, evaluate, respond. Um, and we're looking at two pieces of the puzzle. Uh, we want to describe the information and then we got to do something with it. Um, we have to interpret, respond, that transgression piece. So it's not just reporting on like I see or I can identify. It's what are we going to do with it or about it? Um, Alan Luke. 
Uh, one of the, the the four resources model I always go back to is I think about critical literacy. Um, so thinking about code breaking, meaning making, using the text and then criticizing the text. So looking at information that we're coming into contact with, uh, this is a pretty uh, you know well known heuristic to think about literacy and critical literacy, especially for a literacy community. Obviously, uh, there is a, a social justice vein to this. Uh, you can see that connected to transdisciplinarity from before. Um, I also value uh, the, if you look at a digital lens, you look at the fiber resources model. And what I, I like about this, um, even though it's a little bit earlier than what Luke was talking about, what I really value about this is they bring in the, the individual, the persona, the identity. Um, and we look at how do we communicate, learn from others, connect, project, uh, support one another's. Um, we see a lot of that piece happening in transdisciplinarity. Um, you know, as as we make sense of what's happening in the in the different content areas. So my question is, or or one of the things I was thinking is, if we extend this marbling uh, metaphor now with transdisciplinarity and thinking about critical literacy, what we're doing is we're bringing the individual, the learner, into the the mixture okay they have their own priv their own privilege their own perspective their own identity um their own vantage point so with critical literacy um you know you are still injecting your yourself into the process um but i think with transdisciplinarity what you're really doing is thinking about the the individual the persona the identity so as we think about that marbling metaphor it's it's putting more of ourselves into the mixture net in anything to say about that 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 makes sense and i'm still kind of musing of this uh uh the, the this insight I had a minute ago about uh, critical literacy and, and transdisciplinarity. Yeah, I mean, as I was pulling it together, I was like, "And this is, and this, this, this research talk is a, a form of transdisciplinarity." Because as I was wading into these waters, I'm like, "Okay, what do I find there? What is serendipitously I find there?" Um, these pictures, if you're interested, uh, I spent a little bit too much time, I'm sure, on some list somewhere. Uh, so if you look at marbling uh, for humans, there are these parties where people go marble their skin. Um, so there's that in case you're looking for that for something later to do this holiday season. Um, so question for you. Um, this this idea of marbling, it seems like we're or we're okay with it, but what do we gain and then what do we lose? We asked that question in the publication. Um, is this what we want? Um, you know, it seems like with disciplinary literacy, content area, reading, writing, we're moving further and further into these silos. Um, we make the argument in the publication that that's not a good idea. Um, so what do we gain? What do we lose? Uh, if we go down this path or if we don't go down this path. Well, I mean, it, for me, it just comes down to it, what is the purpose of school, of schooling. Um, and if we're leaning into, you know, kind of that, expert apprenticeship model. It's this idea of preparing for expertise, preparing for um, having a certain set of knowledge and skills and processes. Um, and then there's a completely different view, <laughs> which is, you know, much more um, constructivist that you will gain the knowledge that you need as you're solving, you know, intrinsically motivating, interesting um, problems that you can you can seek the skills and 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 knowledge. And I think those two are very much at odds. And I'd say that the the, the former is much more the American educational system view. Um, so I, I don't know how to, you know, you've got to 
begin with the end in mind. And if you haven't articulated what, what your end goal is, then. Yeah, Carmen put a piece in the text about gaining students with different perspectives. Um, you know, I, one of the hats I wear is as a le literacy educator and I train you on reading and writing cognition. Um, and there is a lot of dialogue about students that might be striving readers or, or they struggle with writing. And so what I value is from a transdisciplinary lens, it's, it's helpful if I can go in and say, okay, you might you know, in my class, I talk about this, you might consider yourself to have a hard time writing, you know, and you're in higher ed, you might have been a struggling reader or a striving reader at some point, but you're in higher ed. Now, think about those kids. And, and a lot of my students are very honest and forthright in class. And I'm thankful for that, and explain some of the challenges that they have. Um, but with the transdisciplinary lens, there's the opportunity to say, well, I, I'm not really getting what you're saying about this area of literacy instruction, but I, I have expertise in this area, or here's my worldview, or here's my perspective. Um, and so one of the things we want to be considerate of is what do we do with this? Um, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about finding problems that are worth solving. Um, one of the ways that we did this in previous research is employed a design thinking perspective, um, in our classroom, some very easy things that you can do if you're working with K-12 students, if you're working with students in higher ed, if you're doing professional development is um, one of the big pieces I really value is breaking down info into nodes and links. And this is a networked learning, um, social network analysis applied to education. Um, look at nodes of information, content, people, you know, facts, text. And then what are the links and what are the connections across those? So breaking down that, sketching stuff out, using like mind mapping software. Um, but this is social network analysis applied to uh, pedagogy. Uh, collaborate, uh, think out loud. So one of the important pieces is to, uh, we spent a lot of time talking about these, um, these visual analogies. Um, and I think that we need to do that is we need to say, OK, from my math perspective or from my literacy point of view, this is what I'm thinking about when I describe these areas and be very you know, specific about what it is. So for us, it was that marbling piece, that that pit, that picture of marbling, like all of us in the room were like, aha, that's it. Um, but we needed to stumble through a bunch of other bad ideas. Most of them were offered by me. Um, there's also a need to collaborate and include stakeholders, experts in the process, and then design thinking basically states that build, test, and iterate. Um, and now I wanted to show a little bit of the latest areas of this research. And this is stuff that we just talked about at a literacy conference. Um, and this is important for uh, this is another tension that exists for those of you that work with educators, you do PD, um, that you're trying to figure it out. Um, and so one of the things that we notice, once again, we work with pre-service teachers. Um, our pre-service teachers need to complete what is known in this, as an SLO. It's a student learning objective. When I went to teacher ed, I thought a student learning objective was something that you put into your lesson plan or your unit plan. Um, but the state that we work in, uh, the SLO is, for all intents and purposes, a unit plan. So an SLO is this larger block of instruction. Um, and students need to, as you see here, students put down their name and their content area. So everything is uh, situated within their content area. This is something that they need to develop two or three of these throughout their program. And then when they go teach in the field, they need to be able to do this as a part of their evaluation process. So this is very important that they know how to do this and do this well. Um, it's a, a very comprehensive way to think about unit planning, does a good job, but you can see the tension that we're getting to where one of the key deliverables for students as they leave our program and most programs in our state is the development of this unit plan for their classroom. Now, in that, we tried uh, to have students collaborate. It didn't go well. 
uh, mainly because we would say, hey, let's take some time in class, collaborate, go into Google Docs, you know, and give feedback on your peers' work. Um, in professional development, when you try to develop interdisciplinary plans, a lot of times we go back to our own little silos. So one of the things we started doing is we started thinking about project-based learning units. Um, and I have the template here that I'll share in the uh, chat. This is a template that uh, we worked on over a series of years with our students. Um, and it's just project-based learning. It's a lot of the, the, the simple guidance on developing interdisciplinary, uh, transdisciplinary work. But once again, this project-based learning unit was, was very good at helping students develop the SLO. Not very good with thinking about interdisciplinary, not very, uh, no transdisciplinary connections occurred. Um, so it was still a lot of the PBL we saw, like in project-based learning, we talk about being interdisciplinary, but one of the things that we were seeing is that it wasn't happening. Um, and that was problematic for us and for our research. Um, and so we rethought this idea of a, um, uh, of a project-based learning unit um, and, and we tried to think of a different way to uh, organize students, to have them collaborate, to find wicked problems and try to solve wicked problems. Um, and so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go into the document here. And so what we did is we made a totally different uh, template to get people thinking about this. Once again, pre-service teachers. So instead of beginning with um, who are you? What area are you from? Why will kids care about this? We began with having individuals talk about who you are, what your, where is your perspective? Where are you coming from? Uh, and then start to talk about what essential questions are important for the educator. Um, and we gave some sample ones. Um, you know, why is diversity important? How can we reduce paper consumption? Um, Doing this for two semesters now, one of the areas that is problematic is or or a challenge is having students think about um, wicked problems and essential questions. But that's a, one of the things we always deal with. Um, then uh, we say with you and your crew. So we refer to these groups of teachers as a crew, like they're on a voyage. Um, and, and then think about you together as one unit. What problem do you want to attack together? We get into a challenge statement. So write out what is your challenge for your group, for pedagogy? Um, what is this unit going to be about? Um, what guiding questions? What's need to know and good to know in this? Um, and all of the time, they're getting feedback along the way. Um, and then at the bottom, we have them go into the SLO once again only because we have to. If we did not have to, we would not. Um, and then one of the most recent things that we did is we started to gamify this a little bit more. So what we did is uh, made a visual where we had checkpoints along the way for students to think about progression. Um, so we said, okay, in, in the beginning of this, we, you know, one of the first weeks of class, we would form crews, you'd have little get to know you meetings and figure out um, in my classes, I will have um, speed dating. So you have a chance for people to get to know each other, do some real simple work and then move to a different group. That way, when they have to do something for a grade, they sort of know who they want to work with and who they don't want to work with. So they form crews. Then they, once they leave that first area or base camp, then they move to the essential questions, the challenge statement, move on, move on, move on. So we use the map just to make it seem a little bit more believable. You can uh, localize it as well. Um, and so one of the things I wanted to wrap up with is this idea of voyages or, or building transdisciplinarity in um, with you and your students. Um, Nana, do you want to talk about Janelle's question in the in the chat? Yes, let me just get to the question. Differences what, between our elementary or secondary kids. Um, for for this uh, for this well, research now or before in general for the for the pre service teachers. So if you had pre service teachers that were going for more of a generalist type certificate, mm -hmm. did you find 
differences between those pre-service teachers and those that were perhaps, you know, I'm I'm a history major, that's yeah. who well, I am. I, I think uh, I can talk anecdotally about this, nothing uh, specifically in terms of, uh, but anecdotally, uh, in in one of our uh, one of our student research groups uh, that uh, designed these uh, lesson plans to look at three uh, uh, D printed gates and a couple of them those were there were some elementary pre service teachers but also secondary social uh, studies and I uh, and they were they were in it they they bought into the idea. And then they saw the connections. But I can tell you that as a math educator, it's really difficult for me to get uh, uh, math teachers really excited often. And I think it comes from uh, uh, from uh, the profile of who, who becomes a math teacher. People who become math teachers are the ones, these are 5% of students who are really excited about uh, you know, manipulating uh, equations manipulating symbols on a page and that's only i would say five percent of population uh and but once they get into this because they also their lives i also you know, i did a podcast a couple of weeks ago and one thing that uh, i said start from your own passions because your passions are going to be transdisciplinary and uh, i had a math uh, uh high school math pre-service teacher and she was very passionate about fitness and uh, and then she saw the she saw the connections. So again, starting from your passions, but I don't have any, you know, I can just tell you anecdotally. I think it, I mean, I agree with that. I think that starting with passions is important. Um, I feel like a lot of our uh, many of the elementary uh, generalist uh, students that we worked with, they you know they would privilege one one content area over others. You know, I see it in our middle grades, folks, not as much our secondary, but it's like, I'm really a math person. I'm doing science just because I have to, um, or, or our elementary, there is, uh, I, I think part of it is that finding, following your passions, but then also there's a, a need to have others there to push your thinking. You know, there was a need to have in our research team push me out of my comfort zone, out of my silo. Um, I'm a little bit more entrenched, you know, because of the the years I've invested in this thing. Um, and so it was a little bit harder for me. But I would I would try and and find different ways to to help to have educators push each other out of their comfort zones. Um, but then also part of it is, uh, this ties into speaking of transdisciplinarity. This ties into how educators view their identity and themselves. Um, they, you know, in, in one of my classes, I had them build websites, and I have students that say, "I believe in fitness and nutrition," and I say, "Oh, on your website for your as a classroom teacher, why don't you put info about fitness and nutrition?" And they're like, "But I can't. This is just me as a middle grades English science person." I'm like, "Yeah, but you're a human being." As a parent of kids, we'd want to, we'd be excited to know what other things interest you. So thinking about different ways to, to help, you know, your, 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 the, the, the educators you're working with think about that. Other questions, comments, Carmen, anything? Sorry, it's that I've been uh, in noisy places. Um, but it's all been very interesting and I agree, but, uh, I'm an ELA person and, um, I'm sorry to say, but math has not been my friend ever. However, I do know, um, that I have kids or I, I had kids when I was in the classroom that were math driven and not really ELA driven. And so whenever we had to, you know, do anything and they had choices to make, they would they would um, tend to to do whatever job it was that was more factual and more um, fact based instead of analyzing literature, for example. Mm -hmm. So I I do see how this is important and how all the voices need to come together because in the end we want problem solvers and there's a lot of problems in this world. So I think this would be the way to mm -hmm. get kids to start transferring 
those skills. Thank you. So thank you for that. I'm just going to indicate that all of the stuff that we talked about, we put out blog posts. So we have one on what is a wicked problem um, and then another post uh, walking you through what are these different practices. And we'll have a final one looking at what is transdisciplinarity. So all of these resources are there for you. Um, Carmen, anything else you want to talk about? Uh, no, that that's it. Thank you. No worries at all. Stay in touch. This was fun having you here for this. All right. Thank you all. Have a good, uh, happy new year. Yeah. Happy new year. Stay safe. You too. Bye-bye. Did you stop recording? Uh, let me stop right now.